Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD-TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. There are many dangerous creatures in tropic seas. Among the most deadly are sea snakes, a true reptile with venom as potent as any cobra. They breathe air, but spend their entire lives in the sea, often remaining beneath the surface for over an hour. Recently, I received an invitation to help collect some of the many species of these highly venomous marine snakes. Since Tom Allen and I are both herpetologists, this gave us a good opportunity to observe sea snakes in the wild. We found them to be very curious about us, but unaggressive. So it was not taking too great a risk to catch them by hand. The biggest danger while catching them was the presence of sharks in the same waters. The snakes were needed for research studies being made by Marine Land of Australia. At the same time, a number of sharks were to be tagged so that the extent of their range could be determined. Sea snakes are found in abundance only in a few places, and one such place is among the coral reefs here to the northeast of Australia. Our voyage to the Coral Sea starts at Surfer's Paradise at the docks of Marine Land of Australia. Under a bright morning sun, we are introduced to Captain Norm Wielden by John Reynolds, Director of Marine Land of Australia. We are invited aboard the Aurora, a strong seaworthy craft which will take us from the dock here at Surfer's Paradise to our distant destination northeastward, the reefs of the Coral Sea. As Tom coils the lines, the Aurora begins moving away from the docks of Marine Land of Australia and out through the harbor. Securely attached to the stern is a device we hope we won't have to use, but it's good to have in case of an emergency. It's a shark cage in which we may have to take refuge if dangerous sharks appear while we're diving. During the two-day cruise, we ready our equipment and ourselves. At last, we reach the reef area where we're to dive, and the Aurora anchors. Everything is in readiness. The cage is dropped at once. John has a spear, Tom a capture bag, and I an underwater lantern. So we're all set. We've left behind the glaringly bright sunlit world above and have entered a more subdued world of turquoise and aquamarine. A world where gravity has become a negligible factor and there is suddenly a freedom one experiences nowhere else on Earth. Great coral formations encrusted with plant and animal life seem impossibly balanced in an alien but breathtakingly beautiful landscape.
As always, a sense of awe and delight envelops us. We have entered a domain of incomparable loveliness, where corals and anemones are like some vast garden. The blossoms and fronds and limbs in this garden swayed gently with the ebb and flow of currents, looking strangely like snow-covered plants which might, in the world above, be spruce trees and grasses and low shrubbery. But this is not all merely a world of plants and scenery. There is a multitude of animal life here and a moray eel becomes our introduction to it. Tom wants a closer look at the moray. It's time to broaden our search for sea snakes, although we will always remain within sight of one another. There's no doubt that the moray is a fierce creature, but with a reputation for aggressiveness that may be overstated. They are reasonably shy animals, though their jaws are powerful and their teeth sharp. I've brought along a dead fish to try an experiment. Some species of moray reach 10 feet in length, but this one is only about six feet long. They're fascinating creatures, worthy of a certain admiration and a strong measure of respect. The experiment works. The moray has overcome its shyness, enough to feed from my hand. Near some boulder-like coral growths, I've located some intriguing little shrimp, equipped by nature to be almost as invisible as any living animal can be. Wonderfully camouflaged, not with color, but with transparency. The shrimp is almost lost to view, regardless of background. In every cleft and every cranny of the coral reef, there is life. Some animals, like the urchin, successfully mimic plants. Almost all species of this animal, which belongs to the same general family as starfish, are poisonous. Actually, the urchin is an inoffensive creature, which moves across the coral on a multitude of movable little stems, pausing often to graze on algae formations. Its poison is located in the spines on the upper part of its domed body. They are usually sharply pointed and can easily puncture a carelessly placed bare foot or hand. The poison in these spines is not deadly, but it can cause considerable pain and infection. While John and Tom are occupied with their explorations a little distance away, I've encountered one of the most graceful creatures in the sea, a nudibranch. It's a type of shellless snail and there are many species. Some are butterfly-like in their swimming, and others, like this one, known as the Spanish dancer, are flamboyantly colored. Over there is what we're after. It's a medium-sized sea snake, evidently searching for its principal food, eels along the reef. Another one is descending after getting air. This is definitely the place for us to start collecting some specimens. I'll alert Tom and John and bring them back here. Now that we had located the right spot to find the sea snakes, we would soon discover how best to capture them. 
We've come back to where I saw the black sea snakes, only to find a large tan-colored one here instead. It's not a surprise, since there are about 50 known species in tropical waters, all of which have venom far more deadly than a cobra's. Right now, he's headed for Tom. I'll have a chance for a close look at it. Although true that its venom is very deadly, this is a remarkably unaggressive animal. But it's wise to use extreme care in handling him. He is just about average in size. They've been known to reach nine feet in length, but usually are five to six feet long. Their bodies are compressed and tails flattened for a life of swimming. They're so well adapted to their marine life that they can't even crawl on land. These snakes are believed to be the most poisonous in the world, with the possible exception of Australia's tiger snake. Small hollow fangs are near the front of the upper jaw. The poison they inject is a nerve toxin produced in glands located below each eye. There are many gaps in man's knowledge of these reptiles, which is why collecting some for research purposes is so important. While Tom is studying the swimming of that sea snake, I've suddenly caught sight of a whaler shark close by. The bait we've placed is attracting him. By the time we've finished studying and collecting the sea snakes, there will be sharks enough around for tagging and observing. So far as we know, a sea snake has never been fed by hand in the wild. I'm going to try to feed this one. He takes the chunk of fish and tries to find a suitable purchase to brace himself for swallowing it. Accustomed to more easily swallowed eels, the snake's having difficulty with the chunk of fish. He's moving now toward a coral cranny where he'll be better able to brace himself and work his jaws over it. We'd better get the snakes we'll need before too many more sharks show up. This one passing is a white tip. I'll keep an eye on Tom while he tries to collect the first specimen. This should be the easiest one since there are no other snakes in the bag. John Reynolds has caught one too, and he's taking no chances of letting that venomous head get close to him. This one's also an easy catch. While they've been admiring their catch, I've located another one on the bottom here.
John arrives first and grabs its tail, but our easy captures of the first two are not to be repeated this time. This snake has no intention of being captured as simply as the others were. They bagged it, and it's a good one. We'll take time to catch one more, and then we'll get them to the surface. There's another white tip. Increasingly, more sharks are coming in, attracted by the scent exuding from the fish bait on the bottom. This is no time to be too far from the shark cage. So we'd better get this final sea snake caught, bagged, and on board the boat so we can concentrate on sharks. This is another difficult one. It very nearly got Tom's hand that time. Just like people, different sea snakes have different temperaments. And this one obviously does not like being handled. The sea snakes can stay submerged for about an hour, but they must breathe air, and we don't want any of these to drown. John and I will wait at a nearby coral head while Tom takes our catch to the boat. We had collected all the sea snakes we needed for the research, and we now turned our attention to tagging sharks. Tom's coming back from the boat where he left the sea snakes in excellent condition, ideal specimens for research. We'll head now for the spot where we drop some large dead fish to the bottom as shark bait. As we pass a ravine-like niche in the coral, we spy a small white-tipped shark who acts as much surprised by our presence as we are by his. It's easy to see we're getting closer to the baited area since cruising sharks are becoming more numerous. White tips are fairly docile sharks, so we'll have no need to take refuge in the shark cage from them. But it's a comfort to know it's handy if we need it. Tom takes the tagging gun we want to test from the side of the cage. And as we move to take our positions along the coral, a whaler shark feeds on a dead fish about five feet long in the baited area. This will be a good place to wait in order to try the new tagging dart on a shark. Whaler shark research is being conducted by Marine Land of Australia and John Reynolds is particularly interested in having us test the new tag dart being developed by the institution. If it works as anticipated, the tag gun will be perfected. If any sharks seem to threaten, 
they will be diverted by John jabbing at them with his spear. A quick check of the new power dart in the end of this gun reassures me that all is ready. This looks like just the right candidate for our test. No, it moved off too soon. The sharks are acting especially nervous today and they really haven't moved in in the numbers we expected. That one coming in now with a remora or shark sucker beneath it would be ideal. Tom's going to try for it. He tagged him. The tag gun has worked perfectly. They're really moving in on the bait now. Though not especially excited, the sharks have to jerk savagely to tear bites from the carcass. We've done what we came for. But the fascination of watching these sharks feed has a grip on all of us, and it's hard to leave. There is a strange primeval quality to the feeding scene of these savage animals so little changed over millions of years. Our air is nearly expended, and for now we must leave this underwater world of the coral sea. Tagging whaler sharks and catching sea snakes by hand in their own element can be hazardous, but it is important. The sharks we tagged will provide new information regarding their movements and lifespan. At the same time, studies of the captured sea snakes by well-qualified herpetologists will provide new information on their life histories and habits. By learning all we can about the various creatures inhabiting the sea, we open new doors to understanding the world we live in. In that way, we are better able to see how we, who have the responsibility to do so, can live in closer harmony with the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.